Introduction The human being is like a sponge. Everything that surrounds them is assimilated in one way or another, which can be both a virtue and a frailty. If the environment we live in is not ideal, this will undoubtedly affect our state of mind, our mood, our productivity, and our deeper emotions. In no other place is this more evident as in the question of how a family takes care of their house. The most general habit in this regard is, of course, accumulation. Days and weeks and months go by in everybody's lives, but in a house, they do not go by in vain. After even the smallest fraction of time, if people aren't alert, stuff will accumulate all over the place. Does this sound at all familiar to you? That's because we've all been through it. We know it all too well. But how does one get out of this vicious cycle? Is there a recipe one can follow? You may be asking these questions fairly regularly, and I believe I have an answer. Decluttering your home like a minimalist. As you will learn throughout this book, it is harder than it seems. This is primarily because it involves being firm against our most ingrained desires and habits. But don't worry. I will walk you through it and give you some of my experiences as I went through the same process. Just remember, there is nothing abnormal about your problem. Many people have been here before, and now it's your turn to get your house in better shape. Chapter 1. Why a Home Can Get Cluttered If you've been feeling frustrated about your house, most likely much of the reason lays here and the alignment between your possessions and your purposes. Joshua Becker Why indeed? It's a simple question, and simple questions can be the toughest to answer. This comes in part from the fact that no two homes are exactly the same. Although two people can both find themselves submerged in the chaos of their own daily lives, the reasons why each has arrived at that point can be totally different. For my part, I can tell you I am a family person. We all know how that can lead to a lot of seemingly harmless chaos, don't we? Well, let me tell you about it. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia with my husband and two lovely children, Lily and Quinn. For as long as I can remember, I have found it incredibly difficult to declutter the house and free up some space for the things we like to do as a family. I have had to give up many plans on account of my own inability to set things straight. It's not that the house posed challenges nobody else has had to face. I'm a financial journalist who has been working from home for the past six months, and as it turns out, I was able to witness just how easy the house would get stuffed with things nobody was really using. Because of this, I started to become an obsessive cleaner. Every day that went by seemed impossibly short, and I started to get suffocated by my own stress. I just couldn't find the time to do everything I had to do. Even worse, this pressing feeling inside me started to show. Friends and family alike looked at me and felt worried. Are you okay? You don't look so well. Is anything wrong, Lisa? How can we help? Most of the time, I didn't answer. No, sir. I just shook my head and stayed quiet. My own clutter was my own private business, I thought. And boy, was I dead wrong about that. The truth is, there is no shame in having a cluttered environment. It happens to everyone. As I said, it doesn't always happen the exact same way, but it's something we all have to go through. If people live in a place, it's only natural for that space to get a bit messy every now and then. Well, in all honesty, it can get more than a bit messy. But that's exactly what we'll go through here. So, has this happened to you too by any chance? One day, you just find yourself in front of a myriad of things to do, appointments to attend, people to call, errands to run. You say, okay, I can do this. You bravely pick up a pen and start scribbling a list, putting everything in order. Whatever it is you're facing, you manage to do it. But a mere two or three days later, everything is upside down again. Not your duties per se, but your home. It's as if this place had turned into a battlefield. Well then, something's going wrong, right? In the process of venturing into this brave mission, you have totally abandoned your own home. 
You were so busy straightening things up at work that by the time you got back to the errands at home, you fell asleep with exhaustion. You wish you hadn't, but you were just too tired and couldn't help it. Then you wake up and realize you're surrounded by a mess that prevents you from thinking clearly. And that gets you really mad, doesn't it? This is something very common for all those people who do not have the habit of tidying up. Don't get me wrong, no one's judging anybody. What I mean to say is, an organized life isn't about raising an arms race against yourself. For all the difficulties you face in doing it, that's just not the right approach. Instead, an organized life is about changing habits and incorporating a new order into life itself. Much easier said than done, right? If I didn't know that already, I wouldn't even be here to begin with. Don't worry, I feel you. But give this some time, please. There are no magic solutions, and the first step is always to realize exactly what kind of situation you're in. This is what we'll cover throughout the book. First, we need to look at the causes of the problem. I will share with you what my own personal methods were to avoid being overcome by a cluttered home. Whether your case is similar or not, in the end, you will certainly make your own choices based on what you need. Either way, keep in mind that before jumping into action, understanding is key to all solutions. Procrastination. There is much to be said about the many reasons that can lead to disarray at home, but what about this state of mind that leads to that state of affairs? What does that look like in the first place? In other words, what goes on inside our heads when things get out of control? Behind actions, there's always a train of thought, even if it's just a tiny instinct. A person can often dismiss that inadvertently while focusing on external factors only. Remember that when you look at a cluttered home, you're looking at the consequences, not at the causes of the problem. The thing is, consequences certainly play a part. They are what sounded the alarm after all, but the reason they do is connected to something we can only find in ourselves. If we are to recover any control at all, we first need to backtrack a little and see what's what. One possible outcome from this inward squinting will probably point towards procrastination. A bit of a fancy word, I know, but I guarantee you'll be familiar with the concept even if you didn't hear the word before. To put it simply, it means doing now what you shouldn't do right now and leaving what is most urgent for later. It means having your priorities a little distorted, which over time can be the threshold to having them totally upside down. The key word here is nonsense. For someone to procrastinate, there is usually no apparent reason behind it. You should be totally free to do your duties. However, you may find yourself constantly bouncing back to other things. Of course, it'd be wrong to underestimate this. On the surface, it seems so gratuitous and easily solvable. Yet that is not always the case. We usually don't realize we procrastinate when we're doing it. And that's because we look everywhere else to find out what's going on, but we forget to look inside ourselves. Picture the following scenario. You want to check the basement and throw away all the things nobody has used in a long time. The deadline you imposed on yourself for this is looming on the horizon and you know you should start as soon as possible. You're sitting there in front of your inbox. You have a ton of work and it has been too long since you were able to tell apart your job from your daily life. The perks of remote work, huh? You desperately want to go down there, but there's just no way you're getting up from that desk anytime soon. You're stuck. By the end of the day, you're very, very tired. You feel a little frustrated and resort to looking at some home craft magazines for comfort. A few minutes go by and you have subscribed to a couple magazines. You've called a friend to tell them about your amazing plans for the basement, and that's it. You didn't even go down there to turn on the lights. Procrastination is sneaky precisely because it doesn't present itself as an outright waste of time. At first, you feel the urge to do what you have to do. But then, all of a sudden, you start getting distracted all too easily, albeit for good reason, but still. You think to yourself, this isn't what I intended to do, is it? Well, it seems important anyway. Once you're done, you look to the side and realize you haven't cleaned up your house again. You had such great plans about reorganizing spaces and making it all look nice. 
but somehow you went astray. When it doesn't seem possible to keep on the wrong track, you remember to call your mother and ask how she's been doing. The two of you end up talking for an hour or two. By now, you really are distracted from your plans, and perhaps not for the best of reasons anymore. In fact, you've missed your deadline by a lot. Then, when you look up to the window, you see the sun isn't there anymore. A cold feeling starts to climb up through your spine, and you get worried. Your entire expression freezes in a kind of panicky grimace. You've just wasted a whole afternoon. What just happened? There was no good reason to avoid sinking your teeth into this project. There's also no way of saying that all the things you did do are in any way inherently wrong. No, this isn't about that. It's about timing. What is more, it's about focusing on whatever you can find to keep delaying that daunting project a little longer. In the end, it is therefore about not being able to confront a particular challenge, perhaps because you're overworked, out of laziness, or perhaps because you're worried what the outcome will be. Either way, you do other errands in order to get distracted from your main goal, turning the basement into a cozy place for the family to hang out. People who suffer from this problem are basically just pushing the can further down the road. Since this will not make things disappear, what happens is, later on, you'll have much less time to take care of them. On top of that, the place looks awful because the project you had is still nothing but a dream. Hence the stress and frustration. Multitasking Not everybody procrastinates, though. Many people are pretty capable of looking at their to-do list and organizing their priorities accordingly. Not because they're better than those who do suffer from the previous problem, but because everyone's different. Remember what I said at the beginning? As seen from the outside, two houses in disarray can look pretty similar. Once we get a closer look, though, we have a very different story to tell. So don't worry, this isn't a competition. It's a matter of distinguishing between different forms of the problem, so as to be able to think of appropriate solutions for each one. Okay then, what happens when you don't find it difficult to focus on cleaning up the home, but rather have far too many responsibilities, each as important and as urgent, so you simply cannot take care of the house the way you'd like to? This is a pretty common problem for people who work from home, or have to travel great distances in their commute, or simply have no one to share their errands with. I call it the superhero dilemma, and it's basically about how a cluttered lifestyle often leads to a cluttered home, because there simply isn't enough time to think about it. In cases like this, you'd like to think about the home, but at the end of each day, you're just not up for it. In this case, you're getting detoured against your will. Now, this is a tough nut to crack, we all like to live in a pleasant place that reflects our caring and imagination, but there are limits to our energy when we have other things to do too. If we are to find order in our home, we can't afford to ignore those limits. They actually need to be at the center of our agenda. That's why multitasking is good, and even vital up to a point, until it degenerates into a superhero dilemma. If you find yourself in a similar situation, the best thing you can do is split the goal into smaller pieces and avoid getting impatient in the meantime. If you're consistent, then decluttering the home will take longer than usual, but it will happen. It all comes down to learning how to multitask properly. As we all know, perhaps nowadays more than ever before, our busy and demanding lifestyles push us to do several things at the same time. It happens both at work and at home. We answer the phone while we put our papers and our ideas in order. We cook while we help our children with their homework. Sometimes we even take on this unnatural tendency to combine actions to the point of absurdity, as when we believe we are able to call people or send text messages on the phone while driving. Has any of this ever happened to you? It is not for nothing that the ability to multitask is something that is often sought after when companies look to hire a new employee. Indeed, many companies value their employees with the multitasking profile ranking. And when we're asked, we ourselves highlight among our talents the ability to do more than one thing at a time. 
The point is that being a proficient multitasker has come to be a standard of modern life. It isn't a merit anymore. It's actually expected that we have this ability. This is when things go wrong, because in order to keep up with expectations, we push ourselves beyond our limits. We promise to handle a zillion things all at once and pretty soon start running in circles, unable to handle so much as one thing properly. The point is that being a multitasker is not the same as being versatile or having a great power of concentration. These latter aptitudes can be considered a virtue in most cases, but only as long as they involved alternating tasks as opposed to doing them all simultaneously. The same goes for when you're trying to make room in a hectic schedule behind the scenes. Think, for example, of Mrs. Doubtfire. Do you know the movie? That poor lady had to go through a lot in order to keep things looking nice and neat. Numerous neuroscientific studies, for example, Hollowell, 2006, have shown that the ability to multitask is probably nothing more than a myth. I know, it sounds crazy, right? Well, these studies hold that the human brain is not equipped to handle more than one single task at a time. At best, it can switch rapidly between one task and another. And even that comes at a cost. Even when we try to shift our attention to common, everyday tasks, like moving a gear lever while driving, it takes us longer to complete them when we're doing something else on top of that. This happens because brain activity suffers in the transition period, and as a result, we lose mental agility in the short term. As I said, the classical example of this is using a phone while driving. So, is multitasking really a myth? The short answer is that it probably doesn't need to be. The problem is that we often overestimate our own capabilities. It is one thing to be able to hold a conversation while crossing the street or reading a book while making sure we don't miss our subway stop, but going from there to trying to balance our accounting in Excel while working through a zillion other tabs on our browser and overlooking our children all at the same time, well, let's just say no one's really benefiting from those juggling ventures. Not you, not your children, not your accounting, and most importantly, not your home either. In other words, doing too many things at once amounts to doing none of them. In that case, you might as well just take a break and really do nothing for a couple minutes. At least that way you'll get some rest. The reality is that we are far more cognitively limited than we like to admit. Handling various things properly means putting them in order and focusing on one at a time one after the other. If you want to apply this principle to your home, that means splitting big goals into smaller pieces. You might not be able to clean up the basement in one single round, but if you do it little by little, you can eventually get it done.